first just like to say thank you to Allison and Polly for putting on this wonderful uh, symposium. It's been a really great two days, and I am um, really honored to be a part of something which I think is such a crucial discussion for everyone to be having. Um, and I'd also like to extend a special thank you to Allison, who I worked for for the better part of a year um, doing research on her um, project looking at experiences of racism from British Columbia all the way to Ontario. And she was kind enough to let me use some of the information that I had collected for her while doing research and encouraged me, strongly encouraged me to write this paper. Um, it was on a topic that I not only knew nothing about initially, but also didn't think I had a whole lot of interest in. So it was really quite challenging for me and uh, it got me to expand my research focus, theorize in different ways, learn to research differently, analyze data differently. So I really thank you for that because it's been really wonderful. Um, and while I'm thanking people, I'd also like to just acknowledge everyone who has presented these last two days. Um, there's been wonderful topics and discussions, and uh, they've got me thinking about my own work. And I know that it's been a while since I've looked at this paper, and I can't wait. You can't hear me? And I can't wait to um, come back to my research and look at it with fresh eyes after this week. Uh, as a historian, I sometimes forget that life happens after 1920. That's sort of like the cutoff for me, and then I kind of lose interest. So it's been really good to hear all these contemporary discussions. The historical ones today are awesome also, but the contemporary ones are good too, and it just sort of reminds me that you know, these issues are still very prevalent. Um, however, as historian Veronica Strongbogue has said, and I quote her, the field of history has an essential contribution to make in solving major dilemmas of our time. Oh, I'm missing the slide, apparently. Let's see. Um, and she uh, says that um, these dilemmas can be traced back to widespread confusions and prejudices about gender, race, and class. So I think that just as it's important to sort of study contemporary instances of racism as we have been looking at these last couple of days, it's also equally as interesting, I think, to study these experiences in the past. Um, perhaps in interrogating instances of prejudice within uh, Canada's past can contribute to a better understanding of systemic racism that we are currently discussing. And that is the interest of this paper. So using uh, Katrine Seek's concept of ethnic drag, within the concept or context of rural Manitoba, sorry, I mapped the performance of uh, blackface, yellowface, and brownface between 1880 and 1950, uh, focusing on structures and processes related to the cultural field. Uh, my research explores the link between ethnic boundary making um, and agency. Through my analysis, I conclude that ethnic drag displays dominant and prevailing white Christian racist discourses. These performances and discourses mark the traits, the physical traits of disenfranchised and very often absent community members, maintaining racial, social, and religious lines of closure. So as I had said, the, uh, my paper presents research that I had done while working with Allison, and I uh, had looked at over 500 local history books, so this is just one of the 500 that I, um, that I looked at. They were all, the books that I consulted were all written in English, um, and they came from rural communities from across the entire province, uh, up north, the western, the east, from the entire province. Um, these types of sources are often pr produced during important years in the community's history, so a 50th anniversary of the community, or 100th anniversary. Uh, many communities also publish smaller versions or pamphlets, kind of like the Coles Notes version, uh, in 1967 to celebrate Canada's centennial. Uh, so these sources are filled with family narratives, newspaper clippings, highlights from each decade, sections summarizing the history of entertainment, sports, politics, uh, farming uh, within the community. And they most often have um, I Remember When sections that provide a venue for um, mostly senior citizens who've been established members in the community to sort of uh, recall their childhood, their youth, sort of like the better days. Um, it's usually a committee of about five to fifteen individuals, some most of which are hobby historians, 
they volunteer their time and effort to uh, compile these books that they search. It's quite a, quite a task. Those on the committee tend to, um, I notice, come from families who have a long-standing history in the region and they sort of, they feel a deep connection to their community. Um, some that I've looked at, the community members even note that their families were among the first to sort of settle in that town. So there's, there's a, a profound connection. What is included in these local history books is very subjective. So what members on the committee deem important is what is going to get put in. So there may be things that are important to other people, but we might not see them in these books. Um, but there is sort of a standard structure I've noticed. Reason Printers out of Altona, Manitoba is a uh, one of the prominent publishers of these books, and I think they provide a, a standard framework of what to sort of include. So there is sort of a, a common theme. So of the 521 histories that I consulted over the course of my research, 66 of them were approximately 13% uh, contain a reference to ethnic drag. In total, I identified 105 separate textual or photographic references to uh, racial masquerading. Um, and these events occurred between 1880 and 1915. The performances of ethnic drag occurred in approximately 65 different rural communities across the province, the majority of which were located in southwestern, western, and the north central regions of the province though there were other instances spread out elsewhere, but that's where the most concentrated numbers were. Notably, it was within communities predominantly um, with British backgrounds that published histories that contained references to ethnic dread. I also think it's worth noting that most of the sources that I found uh, ethnic dread references to were published prior to 1991. And my belief is that there is a sort of a heightened concern with political correctness around this time. Um, in 1989, for example, the Belmont History Book Committee, while they were discussing a local blackface production that had occurred about 30 years prior, um, a member of the committee wrote that while the show was funny at the time, in their sort of present sense of enlightenment, and I quote them there, that it's not something that they would do again. So I'm suspecting that other communities are experiencing this so-called enlightenment feeling that maybe they should just remove those parts of their history from publication. I also suspect that the shifting demographic of the book committee can account for the decline in ethnic drag references that we see after 1991. Because uh, book committees were comprised of individuals ranging from middle age to senior. So books, pub, uh, books being published in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, those on the committee would have had a worldview that perhaps found ethnic drag appropriate, whereas as we move into the 90s and the early 2000s, this view is shifting to that it is an insensitive and uh, racist practice. I found that instances of ethnic drag identified in earlier works seem to be also overlooked in later publications coming from the same region. So a lot of times a town or region may publish a book on the 50th anniversary and then 25 or 30 years later do a re uh, republication and I found um, in several cases an instance of ethnic drag or um, a well-known performance that would have been included in the first edition was excluded later on. Uh, so for example a local history that I looked at that came from the Turtle Mountain region which was published in 1956 contained a reference to a local geisha production and 25 years later when it was revised this yellow face performance was removed and there was also no other references to any other type of um, racial masquerading in this region. I also noted that later publications appeared more likely to exclude any photographs of these types of performances, um, specifically of blackface troops. So I noticed that there had been a lot of photos of blackface performances in sources published during the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, but then after that, these photos sort of disappeared. So references in the later publications were more likely contained in the uh, personal anecdotes that were related by older community members recalling their childhood. Um, to these individuals, ethnic drag was considered an everyday practice and not something that was staged. It was part of the narrative in which they remembered their childhoods and their, their community. So overall, when analyzing the, day, the data I collected, I was surprised that only 13% of the 512 books revealed ethnic drag performances. Maybe I'm just being really hard on Manitoba, but I know that growing up in a rural community,
racism is, is and still is very prevalent. So I was a little surprised. Um, but as I've outlined, I think there's multiple factors that account for this. Newspaper clippings from rural and urban Prairie Canada between 1880 and 1950 <laughs> suggest that ethnic drag was even more prominent than the, the data that I present uh, in this study. So while I think that my paper, um, the, the information in my paper is representative of larger trends of racial masquerading, I think that my research is simply just to start off a discussion, a place to start. Uh, I think other sources should be consulted, newspapers or interviews, um, different approaches. Uh, so now I'm going to turn to the types of ethnic masquerading I uncovered. So over the course of my research, I was able to identify five main types of drag that occurred in Manitoba. The first and most widespread form was blackface, with 53%, so 56 of the 105 references falling into this category. The most common rendering of blackface that I identified was the minstrel show. So it was in this 19th century form of popular entertainment that white performance troops blackened up to character southern slaves. We got to hear about the origins and characteristics of the minstrel show yesterday when Leanne and Marcy presented their research. Um, and I found that the blackface minstrelsy that I noted in rural communities was very similar to the southern style that they discussed yesterday. The standard group was usually about 5 to 15 individuals who blackened their skin. So anything that was visible in their costume. So hands, arms, legs, face. Allison has pointed out to me that sometimes they even used black jelly beans that they had purchased from the local Chinese grocer to do so. The Four Corners History Club stated that actors of the minstrel show in their own community made their legs appear darker by using um, nylon purchased from Eaton's and that uh, the wigs were made from dyed and unraveled wool socks that had been sewn to a nylon skull cap. I noted uh, in the photograph of this particular group of actors that uh, women who were wearing even full length skirts were still wearing nylon underneath. So even if you just at the bottom of the hem, you could just see a slice of their ankle and it would, they were still wearing nylon. So they were fully embodying the racialized other. Um, the facial makeup of these performance troops also resembled that of which we see within the Southern tradition. The overly accentuated white lips were a standard feature. I found that it was local drama clubs, church groups, bands, and fraternal organizations that most often produce these shows as fundraisers for community projects, such as building a new community center or a new skating rink. These performances tended to take place in formal theatrical settings. They charged uh, admission, and they, admitted, they gave out programs. And a lot of times, other people from neighboring communities would travel to that community to watch the shows. This, this was a big deal. People who loved to go to minstrel shows. Um, minstrel shows in rural Manitoba were predominantly put on by an all-male cast, although I did note some that included women and rare, just a couple that had children in the show, um, but there was no all-female casts that I found. I noted in many photographs that when the troops were posing for cast photos, there was a Lions Club or a Rotary Club or a, like a, a Masonic Lodge crest in the background. So it was sort of these types of organizations that were producing these shows. And although less common than minstrel shows, blackface also occurred in less formal settings during community skating carnivals, masquerade balls, and of course Halloween. Here I noted it was mostly women and children dressing up in blackface. Uh, newspaper clippings featured in the local histories I looked at described these costumes, and I'm quoting here as wonderful costumes where people dressed as Negroes, coons, and African warriors. So these more informal costumes played off of the mythicized racial stereotype of the black savage. And uh, this was, this was pre prevalent in a lot of the sources I looked at as well. blackface, the most common form of masquerading I identified was Japanese drag. Approximately 29% or 37 of the 105 references fell into this category. 
Within rural Manitoba, Japanese drag most often occurred during local production of well-known operettas that were set in imaginary versions of Japan. So the most popular of these productions that I noticed was Gilbert and Sullivan, the Mikado. I'm sure you've all heard about the production before, but for those of you who might not have heard of it, uh, it's set in the fictional town of Tiripu and involves characters such as Yum Yum, Nankiku, and Puba. Uh, these cast members are traditionally played by all white individuals who are dressed in Japanese fashion. In many cases, cast members yellow their faces and accentuated facial features with makeup. So again, just like in blackface, we uh, see full body coloring of the skin. The first opera of the Mikado premiered in 1885, and then it remained very popular throughout the 19th and even 20th century. Um, the Gilbert and Sullivan Society of Winnipeg, in fact, produced a show last year that Alice and I actually went to. So it still is very, very popular especially among Gilbert and Sullivan um, fanatics. Josephine Lee has attributed uh, the North American popularity of the Mikado to a taste for whimsical and often unauthentic Japanese decor. I found that in some rural communities, there would be a cafe or a local store, often run by a white individual, that used Japanese interior design. Um, even some advertisements in local stores were uh, saying that they were selling Japanese finery. So people wanted to participate in Japanese, what they thought was Japanese culture, or own something that they thought was Japanese. So for rural Manitobans, the Mikado popularized a mode in which the pleasure of owning Japanese commodities was amplified by a physical engagement and racial impersonation. By performing a Japanese character, actors could physically embody a part of Japan, even if it was just for an hour or two. Other productions of similar style noted in local histories were Madame of Butterfly, Madame Chrysanthemum, and the Geisha. Similar to blackface minstrelsy, productions of Japanese drag were displayed in formal settings where admission was charged and um, programs were administered. Unlike blackface shows, however, Japanese drag productions included a lot more female actors. The bright colors of the kimonos that the costume of the costumes they wore, umbrellas and flowers that were used during the production were noted by some female actors to be fun and exotic. So after watching the Winnipeg Gilbert and Sullivan show with Allison last year, I can see for rural Manitobans who don't have um, the means to travel, these are rural farming communities, they don't have a lot of money, uh, they're, they're sort of segregated to the farm where they need to work. Participating in shows like this may have it was in place of travel for these individuals, um, and I can see that the vibrancy of the show would appeal to these communities. The third type of masquerade performance I identified was Chinese drag, and this accounted for 7% um, of the total references. Unlike Japanese drag or minstrel shows, the majority of the Chinese um, performances occurred outside the auspices of local theater. They took place in more informal settings, such as, again, uh, ice carnivals, masquerades, and school plays or productions. It was predominantly children and women who performed and imagined themselves. And again, I quote a newspaper clipping describing these costumes as Chinese mandarins or Genghis Khan. First Nations drag was the fourth category, with 8% of the references falling into here. They also appeared to occur during more informal settings, school plays, Halloween, and in these instances, individuals, men, women, and children, all participated. Um, I noted in many photographs, those performing dirtied their faces and extremities as part of their costume, but they didn't necessarily participate in the full covering of all of their skin. Um, one reference from New Haven claimed that they used a mixture of cocoa and lard to dirty their skin. Finally, Brom Top was the least prevalent form of racial masquerading that I identified in the sources I looked at. Uh, unique to the Mennonite community, Brom Top frequently incorporated masking as, and I quote Marcy and Pauline here, other ethno racial groups like Jew, Chinese, and First Nation people. As such, depending on the types of racial masking utilized in these performances, one could classify Brom Top into any of the other categories that I've identified. However, there are only three photos that I found, and within each of them, it was very hard for me 
discern which racial category they were trying to um, mimic. So I put them into their sort of the brown top as its own classification. So before moving on, I just want to be clear that all of the ethnic drag that I identified, it was not a two-way performance. It was simply white individuals who were dressing as the other and not vice versa. Um, I'd also like to point out that these performances occurred in relatively homogeneous uh, ethnic communities with very little diversity. And um, as a result, the race that was performed was usually one that was absent. There was usually no members of the community that were from that race. Um, First, Na First Nations drag did happen in communities where there may have been some um, First Nations peoples living in the community or within close proximity. I know a lot of um, local histories that discuss First Nations people traveling through the communities. Um, but in the case of Japanese and Black Canadians, they were sort of only imagine uh, imagined people. Um, I did note ethnic masquerading occurring in communities where there was Chinese individuals living. However, the performances were not uh, performances of Chinese drag. They were other, so usually uh, blackface. So in order to determine the link between ethnic boundary making and agency in rural Manitoba between 1880 and 1950, my study applied Pierre Bordeaux's theory of cultural production. I don't want to get too bogged down into theory um, it can be really heavy, so I'll just try to put it as simply as possible. Uh, cultural work, such as ethnic drag, often reflect the social reality of a given field. In order to understand the symbolic power of ethnic drag, one must interrogate the structures and processes of the field in which they're produced in. So, in this case, it would be the community that they're produced in. So in doing so, the political and cultural power of the performance can, can be identified. So in his study of the changing ethnic mosaic in Manitoba between 1921 and 1961, Philip D. Keddy notes uh, that there's a prevalence of ethnic spatial segregation within Manitoba. So groups tended to settle within their familiar ethnic groups. Um, the province was therefore comprised of ethnic enclaves between the years of 1880 and 1950. These ethnic enclaves were regions where the racial masquerading flourished. These ethnic groups also tended to ascribe to one particular religious identity. So for example, Scandinavian communities were by and large Lutheran. So by highlighting the regions of the province where racial masquerading flourished, one can identify the ethno-religious group that was the most active producer. Um, and this can then be used to determine its cultural and political significance. So in analyzing the field of power within performance communities, I identified five ethnic groups that produced cross are ethnic masquerading, sorry. The first group highlighted was the British Isles. So for the sake of my analysis, I had this include those from Britain, um, Scotland, and Ireland. The, the Irish living in these communities would be Protestant Irish. The second group was Eastern European. So this encompassed communities that were either Ukrainian or Polish. Western Europeans were notable was a, the third group, which was notably Germans and Dutch, and this was uh, by and large um, associated with the Mennonite tradition. Scandinavians were the fourth group, and the fifth and final classification I found was non-homogenous. So these were by and large mining communities that had um, a lot of coming and going, very, um, very flux uh, settlement patterns. Notably, it was communities with near homogeneous British Isle populations that were the most dominant producers. Of the 109 references that I detected, nearly 88% occurred within uh, British communities, most of which were located in southwestern, western, and central regions of the province. So within this area here. I identified this by using the census for the year that uh, was closely corresponded with the performance date. Um, the claim that the British were the most active producers is also underscored by the fact that performances that occurred um, in British communities happened 11 times more frequently than they did in Eastern European ones. And the Eastern European group was the second largest producer of uh, ethnic drag, with only 8% of the references coming from communities where there was 
Ukraine for Polish settlement. More notably, half of the references detected in Eastern European communities came from the town of Dauphin. So while the Dauphin municipality itself is actually Ukrainian, settlement within the town of Dauphin is actually more British. So as Ukrainians moved into the municipality and settled, they moved to the farms and British farmers who had settled moved into the city. So um, there was quite a bit of British influence within the actual town of Dauphin. In my analysis, I also identified five religious affiliations that could be considered dominant in uh, performance regions. The first was Protestantism. So for my study, this encompassed Methodist, Presbyterian, Anglican, as well as the later United Church denomination. Um, within small communities, sometimes there wasn't a church for every, for every religious grouping. So they would have one building and people's religious identity. So if you identify with Protestantism, you may be attend Methodist or you might attend Anglican depending on what was available to you. The second affiliation was Catholicism, followed by Lutheranism and Mennonite respectively. The fifth and final um, group that I found again was non-homogenous and this was again predominantly the mining communities with mixed populations. It was notably within communities whose dominant religious profile was Protestant that I identified the most instances of ethnic drag. So 82% of the 109 came from Protestant communities. As expected, again, most of these communities were located in the same region, so the southwestern, western, and north central regions. Early settlers in Manitoba tended to arrive directly from Europe or via the United States, as they did in Alberta and Saskatchewan. So, um, the settlement patterns were much different. So when people came and settled, they settled in Manitoba with people of their ethnic group and were, off, were also bringing their, um, the worldview with them. So they had similar ideologies and the ideologies that they were bringing from England perhaps were much stronger than those who had come from England, settled in the United States and then moved up to Saskatchewan or Alberta. As a result, British imperialism and missionary philosophy became quite embedded in the culture of southwestern, western, and central Manitoba communities. Um, as Myra Rutherdale has stated, 19th century missionary zeal went hand in hand with an enthusiasm for the British Empire. So typically the British during this time portrayed themselves as civilized, white, and Christian, whereas the other was said to be uncivilized, dark, and not surprisingly, the majority of Manitoba Protestant missionaries also came from the region where ethnic drag flourished, so this lower region of the province. During the years between 1880 and 1950, the church represented both the physical and metaphorical sector of these communities. In addition to holding religious services, it also became the host of events such as the local productions, which I've been talking about, fraternal organizations, early education centers, general town meetings, as well as communal bow suppers. In the majority of communities where the presence of ethnic drag was noted, a long-standing existence of the Orange Order was also identified. In some communities, such as Homefield, Manitoba, the Orange Order was established long before the church was even built. And just as the church often represented the social, social religious, and political center of a community, so did the Orange Order. And quoting the, um, the Homefield local history. They said, the Orange Lodge was an integral component of Homefield societal, societal fabrics. The Orange Order was the social center of the community. In their study of Canadian orange, Orangeism, Cecil J. Houston and William J. Smith argued that the Orange Order was, quote, a bulwark of colonial Protestantism, end quote. They claim that by the end of the 19th century, perhaps one in every three adults, sorry, perhaps one in every three adult males, perhaps one in every three adult Protestant males were a member of the community. <laughs> as a result, the Orange Order, through its own membership as well as contacts through uh, extended family, wives, children, uh, exerted a tremendous influence within these British communities. 
importantly, the Orange Order is also a deeply racist institution whose bigoted nature was very exclusive. It was limited to white Protestant men. So here we talked about exclusion earlier today and the Orange Order is sort of like the, the epitome of this exclusion. It is likely that this type of exclusionary attitude emanated throughout communities where it had a strong foothold. A section entitled Memories in the, the Bethel Cent Centennial Community book demonstrates this exclusionary nature of British Protest Protestant communities in Manitoba saying, quote, many English neighbors spoke disparagingly of folks who spoke another language. They were different, therefore they avoided being friends with them, end quote. White Victorian Christians expected newcomers to want to assimilate and adopt their values, customs, and, re and religions. But it was more than that. Black, Japanese, Chinese, and First Nations people didn't dare dress up in stereotypical costumes, whitening their faces and parading around as white Christians. Their legal rights to citizenship, voting, and land ownership, as well as access to universities, professional programs, were already limited. They didn't want to risk reforming the race of the dominant society. Canada was and still is a Christian society, despite discussions we've had about multiculturalism. Throughout early Prairie Manitoba, church bells were heard each day as a reminder of the dominant religious institution and culture. As uh, Katrine Seek notes in her article, Ethnic Drag and National Identity, Multicultural Crises, Crossings and Interventions, ethnic drag facilitates and exercises exchanges of power. Xenophobia and subjugation of the racial other are foundational components of acts of racial masquerading. Political leaders, policies, and laws in rural Manitoba were designed for white Christian Europeans who enjoyed the privilege of performing and imagining race. Ethnic drag was their, was their domain. It was not for white newcomers, and it was a physical reminder that they were on the outside. You said that you did your research in English? Yeah. Yes. I enjoyed your presentation. I'm familiar with the kind of books you're looking at, too, because my grandparents came from a town that published one of them. But uh, I'm curious about how, because, you know, there were so many, there are so many French towns, and, and I assume the Mennonite communities often published in German or in possibly even in Low German. How, like, do you think that affects the research? And I think do you just think? a little bit, for sure. I yeah. Know, like, if I don't read French well enough. How many did you come across, but approximately, like? How many French books? I didn't yeah, like another I didn't look for French books, okay. to be honest, because I was just looking at English ones. Um, but that is, that's why I wanted to include that the books that I looked at were only English speaking, to sort of be upfront about what kind of sources I was looking at and sort of the, the limitations yeah. to that. And there are certain limitations. And I wish that I could read French well enough to look at those sources. Yeah, I think that would be interesting additional information to get a broader, a clear whole, picture of the problem. Because that's a whole other religious identity as well, right? Mm -hmm. That brings Catholicism into it. So I think that that would be, that's something that's really missing from this paper. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think all three papers worked really wonderfully together. Um, and religion is a key part of all three. And I was listening to Kristen's, and I was trying to puzzle out this little ritual. And uh, I was writing down key words, visitation, revelation, spirits, hospitality, yep. ethnicity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the Christ story. Essentially, it's, you know, going to Bethlehem. <laughs> it's a stage of the cross. I'm not kidding. It's going to Bethlehem. <laughs> then the, the, the flight to Egypt under, under disguise, precisely, right? Um, now listen, you know, we're all so secular here. Really, <laughs> there is a strong religious element in all of this, especially the, the fundamental of conversion, right? Mm -hmm. Under the threat of, you know, religious-based state, you know, if you don't convert, you're exiled. And um, one of the things you mentioned was, okay, they can be Japanese, but only for an hour. But that's precisely the point. You don't want it extenuated because then it gets to be a real claim. So the, the theater space, which is actually coming from religious theater is specific, specifically under this time-space constraint, but that's where drinking comes in. Mm -hmm. There's this wonderful extenuation where it's, you know, if you don't guess it, but you don't really want to guess it because you want to have a couple more drinks. So there's a kind of complicity about, uh, being, about being hidden, remain, remain hidden. And then the last thing I was going to say is that, um, this, you mentioned it, uh, I, so many mentioned it, I think you did, about liminality. And I think it was Kristen, this, the, sort of Victor Turner's notion of liminality. 
and the notion that for this moment you're sort of acting out. But then it has to be all recuperated back into normalcy. But there's a way of as a sort of safety valve. You can sort of um, expand all this, all this tension about who are you, what are you, what should you be, what can you be. But then that's, it falls back into this. Well, and that comes back to the idea of exclusion, because there, if you look at some communities where there are established um, Chinese business owners who are living, and they are involved in the local church, they're being yeah, as exactly. white and Christian as they possibly can. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But there's still that element. And the church can't reject it because they convert it. I mean, mm -hmm. they've made that gesture. But it's your physical appearance. You're not putting exactly. And you can't, like, like I had mentioned, they're not going to leave their faces white. And, yeah. and that's so great still as, as a white person, yeah. right? Yeah. So you have that. There's still, an element, as much as you're admitted into the community, right. you're still, there's limitations to yep. I did also uh, just want to mention that a lot of the, uh, the Mennonite books or the, the books from Mennonite communities are now in English because they're. Um, that's the kind of thing book at this point, but there's a kind of revival of Lord German, and um, so that has, I think makes a difference in terms of the accessibility of the material on Pranaka, particularly which we're going to be talking about uh, this afternoon. And, and I just want to say I'm so happy to see the Melina book up there, right in the center, <laughs> because my partner's family uh, moved from Saskatchewan to Melina. And so I, I have that book actually. I know you lent it to me. I probably did. Yeah, because <laughs> there's a book in my Is there a black face in there? I think so. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> and I just awesome. look gross. <laughs> in Does a gross someone way. else have one? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. You go ahead. I, I mean, you, and you're very modest about what you did because you not only looked at Manitoba, but you also looked at Saskatchewan and you went into to Alberta as well. So you've looked at a mountain of these books. And I should just say this is. If you look at what's in newspapers compared to what's in the local history, it's quite astounding. Yeah. Um, the tradition and, and the and the and how common it is. Uh, so that would be something that we could think about doing to to expand this project to, to combine the two to see just how prevalent it was. It's excellent. It ended up being very fun to pour through all those books. I mean, because I didn't really know anything about no, local great history. Analysis. And it was great job. Great job. It was, it was good. It's a lot. I have Susan first, sorry. <laughs> I can't, I'm missing you. can't see me. <laughs> okay, I, I was astounded. I mean, I've been in Manitoba for 40 years, but in Winnipeg, so like blackface minstrel shows in rural Manitoba, and why is it the big thing? And, and but was there a heyday? I, you, 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 there was a fairly long period, but there must have been kind of a, a time when it was really hot to do that. Would that have been like the 20s, 30s? And where's that coming from? Like. Is it from the popular movie? Is it from what they see in movies? Because of course, it did appear in American movies, and that's something that I haven't looked at personally. But that's a really good question because that is, yeah, it's just there's so much of it, and there's these huge perform like there's huge performance groups, like fifteen people. But they were all local people. They're right? all local it wasn't people. a traveling troupe or anything. If like that. it was some some groups like the, some Masonic lodges I noticed would put on a show and they travel to a couple of neighboring communities, but it was all locally based. Very proud of these shows. This was a really big deal. They did an awesome job. Um, and like a, in the earlier local history books, they published copies of the programs, who was involved, pictures, everyone smiling. It's a really, really, it's a fun time for the community. It's just a big thing. And I was really surprised too because I was like, oh no. I just I want to give the last word to Neverland because I had to cut her off last. Yes, um, I, I was really, I, that was a great paper. Actually, all of the, the papers are really good. And I, um, I, I liked what you said towards the end about, you know, Canada is still a Christian-dominated country despite the discussion of multiculturalism. And just coming back to what you were saying earlier, because I saw this theme of, I, I did too see this theme of religion uh, with, with uh, the, the previous paper too. And, and uh, it does bring up the question for me, it's not, the exclusion aspect, but really the belonging aspect of who's in and who's out. And, uh, and I think it comes back, like with the previous paper too, like the whole thing about alcohol, who's in and who's out. If I was living there, I would be definitely excluded because I don't drink alcohol and I wouldn't want people coming into my house who drink alcohol. But I would be very excited to do Halloween or something and give non-alcoholic drinks, you know? So, so it's, it's this question of, who is in and who is out, and who has the 
uh, who's the dominant norm that decides who's in and out, and and just that and that religious undertone is there in all, all a lot of our makeup of communities and um, policies. Unfortunately, that's going to have to be the last word on that one. So thank you very much.